Coming up on this week's show, we have a supersized episode featuring TJ Klune as we celebrate the release of The House in the Cerulean Sea. This is the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. Each week, we bring you exclusive author interviews, book recommendations, and explore the latest in gay pop culture. Welcome to episode 232 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Will from WillKanaus.com, and with me, as always, is my co-host and husband, Mr. Jeff Adams. Hello, everybody. This episode of the podcast is brought to you in part by our remarkable community on Patreon. We'll have more information on how you can join the community at the end of the show, along with a sneak peek of what we have coming up for you next week. Well, it's another week, another show. We hope everyone is doing well, staying safe and sound at home. And if you've got some extra time on your hands, we hope that you are enjoying yourself reading a good book. Indeed. Times like this, it's good to have a book nearby. So just one bit of news this week before we get into all things TJ. We were actually on this past Friday named to Book Riot's list of 33 of the best book podcasts for all genres. Thank you so much, Book Riot. It was so awesome just to find ourselves on that list. This list truly covers so many genres. There's comic books, vintage books, romance, young adult, sci-fi fantasy. The podcast LeVar Burton Reads is on this list. We are so honored to be on this list and in such good company. I mean, between Book Riot and being on Oprah's list last year, it's it's pretty amazing. So thank you, everybody, for enjoying our show and helping us land on lists like this. Yes, if you need a break from all of the reading that you're surely doing right now, listening to a podcast is an excellent way to while away a couple of hours. And this list has got some wonderful recommendations. We will have the link to that list in the show notes. And thanks again, Book Riot. So I am so excited that it is release week for The House in the Cerulean Sea. It is just so amazing. T.J. Klune continues to blow me away with his books, and this one is simply extraordinary. He's balanced his amazing and crazy sense of humor, and here I'm thinking about books like the Tales of the Verenia series and How to Be a Normal Person, along with his keen sense of storytelling, things like the epic Green Creek series or the standalone murmuration. And he's created a tale of found family, the importance of kindness, and the courage to speak up for those who need it most. The story revolves around Linus Baker. He's a caseworker with the department in charge of magical youth. Poor Linus, he leads such a dreary by-the-book life. His job is, involves checking up on the orphanages under the department's care and making sure that they're operating by an extensive set of guidelines. This poor guy carries around the most ginormous binder of guidelines with him. It's kind of ridiculous. He's very known for his detailed reports, and it's because of those that he's actually tasked by extremely upper management to go to the Marseilles Island Orphanage to check up on its caretaker, Arthur, and the six unique magical children that live there. Now, Linus's life changes just by going out to the orphanage. He's always wanted to go to the sea because he lives in the very gray, drab city. And, of course, as you can tell by the title, this orphanage sits in the Cerulean Sea on this island. As he gets away from the city, he gets out of that gloom and the rain and into the sun. It's really a Wizard of Oz moment as his world goes to color from gray. Linus' journey of self-discovery is the heart, or perhaps one of the hearts, of this story. And his progression into the light is part of what makes this story so great and special. He finds that there's much more to life than rules and regulations, and that there's a need for kindness, compassion, and understanding. The kids at the orphanage are an incredible array of characters that I think really only could spring from TJ's mind. We've got Lucy, or Lucifer, and yes, we're talking about the Antichrist there. There's Talia the Gnome. Chauncey, who's a green blob with eyes on stalks, who really all he wants to be is a bellhop. That is that is his goal in life, is to be a bellhop. There's Sal, who's a shapeshifter, who when he becomes nervous or scared, just becomes a little tiny dog. There's Fee the forest sprite, and Theodore, who's a, a wyvern who hoards buttons. Nothing makes him happier than adding to his hoard. The kids and Arthur have formed an amazing family. All of these kids have come from other orphanages for various reasons, and Arthur does his best to protect and teach them. 
perhaps his most important lesson to them is that they don't necessarily have to be who people think they should be. Such as Lucy doesn't necessarily have to give in to the idea that he is the destroyer of all worlds. Early on, Arthur challenges Linus, and it really sets Linus off on his journey. As he says, I think if you open your eyes, you'll see what's right in front of you rather than what's listed in the files. And boy, are Linus's eyes open. The children are incredible with their childlike wonder, their massive sense of protection and care for each other, and even though they're all young, they are well aware that the world doesn't really want them, especially the town that is across the sea from the island, where so much of the difficulties arise as this story goes on. TJ's created six distinct characters in these children that you can't help to fall in love with. I mentioned Theodore's delight in the buttons and Chauncey's bellhop dreams and his very protective urges towards Theodore. And then there's Lucy. He's wildly funny as he pushes Linus's buttons sometimes, threatening to like blow up his brain. But then you see his other facets, including a love of classic music from the 50s, especially vinyl albums, and that he knows that he could cause damage but yet all you really want to do is wrap him up in a hug and protect him from the world and in some ways from himself. As Linus spends his time with Arthur and the kids, he starts to see how messed up extremely upper management is and that the rules aren't exactly all they're cracked up to be. And when it comes to that hateful town I mentioned, he realizes that there are changes needed and changes that he speaks up for. And this is a romance too. The romance isn't forward in the story, but there is a super sweet, just swoon-worthy romance that blooms between Linus and Arthur. The spark between these two is pure romance, and it feels like old-school courting. Now, that's not to say they don't have problems. And, oh, do they have problems they got to take care of. You have no idea. But it all makes up part of this very beautiful story. Yes, in case you haven't figured it out, I love everything about House in the Cerulean Sea. Linus's self-discovery, his romance with Arthur and these amazing kids living at the Marsias Island Orphanage. There's something in this book for everyone, and as you'll hear from TJ in the interview, the book can actually be read by all ages. I've got a hardback on pre-order so that it can sit on my shelf with my all-time favorites. That's how much this book means to me. I give my highest recommendation to The House in the Cerulean Sea by TJ Clinton. Stick around. We've got an interview with the author coming up next. In the hockey player's heart, the feel-good gay romance by Jeff Adams and Will Knauss, hockey star Caleb Carter returns to his hometown to recover from an injury. He never expects to run into his one-time crush at a great school fundraiser. Seeing Aaron Price hits him hard, like being checked into the boards. The attraction is still there, even after all these years, and Caleb decides to make a play for the school teacher. You miss 100% of the shots you never take, right? Aaron has been burned by love before, and can't imagine what a celebrity like Caleb could possibly see in a guy like him. Their differences are just too great. But as Aaron spends more time with Caleb, he begins to wonder if he might have what it takes to win the hockey player's heart. Get the hockey player's heart at Amazon.com. So I think this week we have the longest episode of the podcast ever with the longest interview that we've ever done. I got to sit down with TJ to talk about not only The House in the Cerulean Sea, but also the May release of The Extraordinaries and the release of the final book in the Green Creek series, which is coming in August. And he even gives us a little sneak peek of what's coming beyond all those books. So we're looking out into 2021 as well. So let's get to that. And TJ. I am so thrilled to welcome TJ Clinton back to the podcast. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me again. I really appreciate it. It's oh, good to be back. We have so much to talk about. You have so much going on. Amazing no, stuff. No, it's crazy. It's been a wild ride for the past year or so. So I'm very excited about what's coming up. The big thing that's happening the week of March 16th, as this does air, is The House in the Cerulean Sea comes out, which is your debut with a Big Five publisher, or at least an yeah. imprint of a Big Five. Right. As somebody who's watched your career, it's so thrilling to see you cross into this realm. And and with well, this thank you. and with this book, where did this book spring from your head? Because it's really unlike anything we've seen from you so far. It is. It's The House in the Cerulean Sea is a it's a bit of a quirky fantasy, but it deals with some very real topical specific issues that it actually started from a Wikipedia article, <laughs> because I have a tendency to 
get lost in Wikipedia for a long time and that's a problem. But I will be in one article and I'll click on another one, then another one, and then another one until I'm completely off what I was trying to look up to begin with. But I came across something known as the 60s scoop, which was in Canada during the 50s and 60s where indigenous children were taken from their homes and put into government sanctioned orphanages, for lack of a better word. And the idea stuck with me. It was something that I could not shake. And and this was this was at the end of 2017-ish. I had just finished writing my YA debut, The Extraordinaries, and I was looking into wanting to continue along in that vein with something a little bit different. And so when I stumbled upon this article about children being taken because they were different or they didn't adhere to what standards people thought should be at the time, it was something that I couldn't get out of my head. And, but I didn't want to co-opt, you know, a history that wasn't mine. I'm a cis white dude, so I can't ever really go through something like what those children had to go through. So I, I sat down and I was like, I'm just going to write this as a fantasy. I'm going to write about, about almost Orwellian society where the government sees everything and watches everything you do and follow a, a man who is stuck in a rut. He's a cog in a bureaucratic machine named Linus. And I wanted to follow him. He's he's not necessarily prejudiced at the beginning, but he believes everything that everybody has ever told him. His, his supervisors, the management, superiors, everybody's told them that things have to be a certain way. So he's gone that certain way. And when I finished the book in spring of 2018, it was a couple of months later that all the news came out of everything that goes on at the United States southern border with children being taken away from their parents and put into government station camps. And I was like, oh, this is this is a little too close to home. I don't know how I feel about this. So I, I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with it, if I thought I should change it or if I should leave it as it is, because it's – it's topical now more than ever and it's prescient and it sucks that that has to be the way. But I think that, that this story will bring the idea that we need to have to speak up. We have to speak up for those that can't speak for themselves. And that's kind of the theme of the whole book is, is to raise your voice for those who don't have one. One of the many things that struck me as I read it is I couldn't decide what year it was. Yes. Other that than was that intentional. Was- other than that it was after the day the music died. Mm-hmm. Because that's referenced a few times because music plays a big part of this story. Yeah, right, right. And it's all, it's all, you know, 50s, 60s music too. And there's in the book, there's no mention of a television. There's no mention of cell phones. I think in one instance, Linus uses a diner's club credit card, which is mm-hmm. something that people don't use anymore. And that was intentional. Just, I I didn't want it necessarily to be nebulous about the time it was set in, but I wanted it to have an old fashioned feel because this, this kind of fantasy, it's a gentle fantasy. It's, it's low fantasy. And it's not something that you really see a whole lot anymore. The, in the, in the 60s, 70s and 80s, there was a lot of gentle fantasy and that's something that I, I, I'd never written before, and I wanted to try it. So that's why I went that direction. And it, it's an homage of sorts, but it's also, I love, you know, I, aside from the bigotry and the homophobia and the misogyny, <laughs> I have a, a thing for the, the, the era of the 50s and the 60s. It's, I like the music, the style of clothing, the dress, the, the way the houses looked, all of that, the aesthetic, I guess mm-hmm. we could say, of the, of the 50s. And so that's kind of what I wanted to bring into the book itself. You saying that reminds me, before I pushed record, uh, we were talking about how kind of I found the book. And I was connecting it most to Bones Beneath My Skin, which I think if you mm-hmm. take out kind of the homage there to Stranger Things and kind of some Stephen King work that fits this. But hearing, just talking about this now, it also connects a little bit to Murmuration where you use right. that time frame right. a lot too. Yeah, it is. And the Murmuration was my, was my love letter to Twilight Zone because I love that show more than I should possibly. And this, this book too, I wanted to still stick with that kind of feel because there's there's something 
I don't, not necessarily innocent, but there's something just different about that. We're not so far removed from it that it's alien, but we're still so beyond it that the idea of that time frame existing is, is in a way it's an antique and it's just, people were different back then, both good and bad. And I kind of wanted to explore that time frame, but not necessarily stick that with a label in the book itself. And in Cerulean, there no year is given. So it could be any year just for the fact, just because I didn't mention television or just because I didn't mention cell phones or anything like that doesn't mean they exist, but it, it, it was, it was intentionally given the feel of it being a bit old fashioned and old timey. Tell us about the, the children who populate this orphanage, these six kids. Yeah, they are. <laughs> They're going to be uh, Talia. She is a girl garden gnome with a long flowing beard and a heart of steel that hides a marshmallow center, I think. Mm. There is a forest sprite named Fee who distrusts everyone she doesn't know. There's Theodore, who's a wyvern, which is a small dragon, and he hoards buttons underneath the couch in the living room. My favorite, and it's probably sacrilegious to say I have a favorite, but I do, is an amorphous green blob named Chauncey, who wants to be a bellhop more than anything in the world. It's, it's a singular focus for him, and he, even when I was writing it, he was hands down my favorite. There is Sal, who is the oldest of the bunch and the quietest, and he happens to be a shifter. But as you know, I've written shifters before. I've written quite... a few books on shifters <laughs> and I didn't want to do that with this. So I made him aware Pomeranian. <laughs> I don't, I don't necessarily know how I came to that. I think I thought it was funny at the time. And then when I started running with it, I was like, Oh, maybe this is kind of stupid, but then it just, it fit with him for the kind of character he is. And it, it, it made me appreciate him. I think a little bit more because the idea of a, a, a character like him he's a big boy he's he's a teenager that he turns into this tiny little dog it there's something very sad about that to me and i think it, it, it strikes home to the character and the last kid who i bet is probably going to be most people's favorites he's six years old his name is lucy and he is the antichrist <laughs> and um and they, you say that like was, it's the most normal thing in the world <laughs> all right i know i know and it's 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 quite a varied spectrum all six of these children and that was that was intentional because i wanted to i didn't want to make them the same they they each have their own indistinct or very distinct personality and that shows through they they all act differently they all talk differently but they do have a bit of sameness to them because they're being raised together they're growing up together and for all intents and purposes they're brothers and sisters and so they are all unique, but they all care very much about each other and want to protect each other as much as possible, which is why they don't necessarily like when Linus shows up on the island to begin with. Mm -hmm. And I'll just go against convention. Sal was my favorite. Was he? Um, okay, good. <laughs> something about the quiet kid, the one who tries to just, you know, stay in the back. I like the the connection that he and Theodore have. You know, that mm -hmm. they're kind of tight with each other. and They're buddies. They are. They're definitely buddies. And I, I think that, that Theodore is very protective over Sal. Or I think all of them versa. are. I wasn't really yeah. sure who protected more there. Yeah, it, it, it yeah. is. And it, Sal is, I think he's the character that I worked the hardest on because I wanted to give him such a different voice from all the others. Because one, he is the oldest. And two, I think that through what their backstory comes out, we've seen... I think that he probably carries the most trauma and it, it was important for me to get that right because you can't gloss over something like this, especially not taking away from the fact that this book is, you know, a comedy. It does deal with some very serious issues and I didn't want to skate over that with, with each of the children. So I, I had to make sure that each of them had a proper arc, but Sal was, gave me the most trouble until I finally sat down and, and it clicked and I got it right. Mm -hmm. and I, yeah, you definitely got it right. You got it right across the board. Really. <laughs> Good. I'm glad to hear somebody else say that. <laughs> you mentioned it's a comedy, and there's humor there. I didn't know how to put the book in a genre. 
it's hard to define, right? It, it, and it's, that's, that's why I, I'm comfortable with the term gentle fantasy. And I think that people who read it will understand that. But when you're reading the blurb on the back of the book and it's all like, oh, by the way, here's the Antichrist. <laughs> you're kind of like, well, what? <laughs> but it, it's not, hmm. This, but let, me, let me put it this way. This book can, and I hope will, be read by most any age. I'm hoping that parents with kids who are 11, 12 years old will read this book together and get something from it. Adults will get something on a different level than, than maybe their kids will, but kids will get the message that I'm trying to get across just the same. Going through the editing process, there was some more serious language in it. I mean, let's, let's just, I can talk about it here. I use the word fuck twice in the book. And my editor was like, what if we took those two F words out and then anybody can read this because people will go into libraries, people will go into bookstores and looking for books to be able to read with their kids or, or to give their kids to read and say, does this book have, you know, any strong language or any strong violence or any sexual situations? And if they hear the book has the F word in it, they may not, they might not give the book to their kid or the bookseller might not be able to recommend it. And so while I was, fuck happens to be my favorite word that I put it most often in my books. <laughs> so to take that out, I was like, oh, okay, that's fine. We'll see what it does. And, but then I thought about it. And if a 12 year old can pick up this book and read it because of that, that minor subtraction, I'm totally okay with that because I want, I want kids to be able to read it. I want anybody who wants to read this book to be able to read this book. It's, it's, meant for everyone and i hope that the the i think that the topic and themes of the book are very timely unfortunately what i hope i guess is at the very end that people walk away from this book thinking that there's still kindness in the world that we can still do good because we're all mad all the time about everything yeah. we turn on the news the world is on fire the government is a mess everybody hates each other and that's why I love reading and that's why I love writing. It's an escape. And so when I when I want what what I want people to do with this book when they finish is just to just to remember that they're still good in it. Good out there. They're still kind people. And now if we work together we can, you know, combat all this crap that's being flung at us right now. It was really like the best message. I mean, because even before Linus gets to the island, he's got a boatload of crap going on for him. Right. And then yeah, he, he goes has his to the own island issues. to solve the rest of everybody's you know not realizing right. that's what he's there to do but that's where he ends up in like solving right problems. right and and i want to make sure that that you know i'm not going to be getting into spoiler territory but not everything will be completely 100 percent solved by the very end of the book because that's not how life works you know right. we 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 begin and we start and we work towards something and so when by the time the book closes, we're we're at their beginning for their next step. And though I don't plan on writing anything more in this world, you know, flash forward two years and I'm like, oh, by the way, here comes the sequel. But the I, I, I wanted people to know that when they reach that last page to say, hey, yeah, I wish I could know what happens next. But at the same time, sit there and think, well, you know what? I bet they all did good. I bet they all went out there and conquered the world. Because it would be, it would have been very easy to give a very trite pat ending to this, and to tie every, up everything in a neat little bow. But that's not the way life is. Life is chaotic. It's messy, and it doesn't always adhere to what we want it to. But I know that they're on the right path. So, and uh, we have to give a nod to the love story here too, because Linus and Arthur are so sweet. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I know, sweet for me. That's and, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Because usually being torn apart, <laughs> right? And it is, but again, it goes with the idea of it being slightly old-fashioned. They, the way that they move around each other, it is almost courting in a way. Mm -hmm. They and and but it's not. It's not like you know they're giving each other gifts or anything like that. In this case, they sit down and have discussions about philosophy, and that to me was there was a sweetness to that because it, it was Arthur being in his comfort zone and Linus not and having to step outside of what he has, his his strict and stringent routine and having to go beyond that was a delight because he is a, Linus is a fussy, fussy man and I 
love that about him. He he thinks he knows the way things are, and then when he sees that they are not, he's very resistant to try to change because he likes his rules, he likes his regulations, and to have that taken from him is not something he ever expected to happen, but of course it does through the kids and especially through Arthur. Mm-hmm. It was just, it was, it was perfect. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think so as well. <laughs> we don't usually talk about your book covers. And Reese Dante has certainly done right by you on many, many occasions. Many, many. Yes, she is my go-to. And oh, by the way, just just so I can, I just want to, speaking of Reese Dante, I just want to shout out Reese Dante because with this whole issue that has gone on with our former publisher, I didn't know how to format stuff. I didn't know what I was going to be doing with with trying to republish. Reese Dante stepped up and reformatted most of my books she did she did everything she did all all, all, she fixed all the covers even the covers that she didn't do for me she helped redo to make the full cover up she is an amazing person and i love her and all my books would not be here without her so i just wanted to shout out reese dante i give a big shout to reese dante too she's awesome the work that she does is gorgeous yes Uh, murmuration still one of my all-time favorite covers me too Uh, but the Cerulean C cover, my God. <laughs> yeah. Like when they first sent me the concept, it was hand drawn. And because that's the second cover, there was another cover that was originally a place that I adored. It was, it was great. It was a beautiful hand drawn cover. And they, the, the, the big wigs who were paid the, the billions and billions of dollars to make such decisions decided they wanted to go to a different direction. So I was like, ah, oh, shit. So they sent me a cover concept, and I was like, eh, it's all right. It's just like it was just a hand-drawn of a house sitting on a hill with trees blowing, and it looked like something you'd doodle like on a cocktail napkin or something like that. So I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess we'll have to see what it is. And then a few, a uh, couple of months later, my editor at Tor Alley sent me the cover as people know it now, and I was just like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Like I, the fact that it was, I mean, the fact that it looks as it does is just one thing. But I, when I was looking at it, I thought, okay, I can see where the model is. I can see it on the cliff. I can see that how the 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 creator made the house and everything like that. But all the background, all of the sky and the ocean and the sun, all of that has to be digital. And then the the creator, an awesome guy who runs Red News Studios, posted the video of him, of the actual model of the cover. And all of that is handmade and it is mind blowing. His, his, the level of talent he has just blows me away. And I am, I am honored to be able to have that cover for this book because it is, it is literally just perfect. It is absolutely perfect. The detail is just exquisite. The video. I mean, if this ever becomes like a movie or it lives in that format. I could see that video being in the title sequence. Well, you know, the... it would be awesome if this, if it does become a movie, if it was made stop motion animation, like, like a uh, nightmare before Christmas or Coraline, something like that. Yeah. And then I would hire the hell out of him <laughs> to oversee all of right? that because his, he does stop motion animation and it's, it's brilliant. It's that everybody go look up Red Nose Studios on Instagram to go watch his his art and everything he does because his stuff is just out of this world. Yeah, well, I'll link to hit to that Instagram, but I'll also go back into the archives and find that video of the of that of the house. Okay. It's incredible. It is. It's absolutely wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. Now you're headed out on a tour to support this book, which will be the first. <laughs> First for you, we're used to seeing you, you know, show up at GRL and maybe another event or two here or there, but yeah, TJ Clune on tour. Yeah, that is frightening. <laughs> it is very, very scary because when they, when they first said, yeah, we're going to send you on a book tour, I was like, oh, okay. So I'll go to like four or five different places. Uh, no, <laughs> they're sending me everywhere for, for I think that the house in this really sea. I mean, by the time this comes out, I'll be doing the launch here in Virginia. Then I'll be going to the Charlottesville Book Festival for two days in March. And then from there, I'm flying all over the country, I think, to like 10 or 11 different places 
for this book tour. And look at me now. You're, you're seeing January, TJ. I'm soft and, and rested and relaxed. <laughs> I'm sure by the time that March occurs that I will be completely high strung and out of my mind. <laughs> yeah. I think that's why we decided to do this while you were still yes, calm and right. soft, TJ. <laughs> because if we if we had tried to record this in March, I would be shrieking into this microphone right now going, no, everything is fine. Everything is wonderful. I'm having such a good time. <laughs> oh, like in, in 10 days, I have to go and give a 10 minute speech in front of a whole bunch of people. <laughs> Of a whole bunch of librarians and booksellers at the ALA convention, and so I'm properly terrified because I don't do public speaking, but I have to do that a bunch now. So yay! This will be your pilot run for the ALA. Just the ALA yeah. will be your pilot run. <laughs> right. I know. I know. But imagine if that goes bad, and then that's going to be. <laughs> I'm like, oh shit! Are you really sure you want to put me out in front of people? For some reason, people at Tor th seem to think I'm charming, which, okay, you know, people are allowed to have opinions even if they're wrong. <laughs> so I'm just like, okay, you're putting all this work and money behind me, so I guess I have to go do something. <laughs> you're charming. <laughs> I'm, yeah, there's. I think the word you probably mean is awkward, which is totally fine. I've accepted that, but yeah. <laughs> Charmingly awkward, I guess. Yeah, word. yeah, we can do that one. I, I will accept that one. And then I might be going to Comic Con. I don't know Ooh. if they can get if they want me. They want me to go to Comic Con, and they're trying to get me to Comic Con. And if they do, I will go there and I will do whatever they want me to do. I will cosplay as like the sexiest ninja maiden there is if I have to. <laughs> but I will go and be at Comic Con because that is my nerd dream. I've never been, and I want to go. And even if. Even if I go just to go and just to see everybody, that's great. But they actually want me to do book stuff at Comic-Con too. So I'm like, yes, <laughs> I will do awesome. that. I'll do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. You'll, you'll live through this first book tour to get to Comic-Con. <laughs> like I, I will. The I will. And then, yes, I will. I will. I will do anything that they tell. I will give 10 minute speeches in front of dozens of librarians. That's totally fine. Get me to freaking Comic-Con, man. <laughs> <laughs> Because I want to, I want to get to Comic Con. I want to make connections, and then all of a sudden, pretty soon there'll be a Green Creek television series. That's my goal. <laughs> I don't, I don't know how I'm going to work that, but I have it in my head of TJ plus Comic Con equals Green Creek television show. <laughs> I don't know the rest of the equation, but I'll get there. I think there's more algebra in there somewhere, but <laughs> yes, yes, but I'm not good at math, so we'll just pretend there's not. <laughs> And I'm all for that. Yeah, please find the Green Creek TV series. I will do it. I will do it. I'm gonna. I'm going to. I'm going to do what I can to make that a reality. But if there's anything that's going to come, film or television wise, it's probably going to come with what these next two books are going to be. So yeah. that'll be pretty cool if that happens. And, and let's talk about the other book. We get into a little more yeah. territory here because I have not read the Extraordinaries yet. Although I'm happy to say that the Ark is sitting waiting for me. Hey, um, we've talked a little bit about this at our last GRL conversation because it was it was sitting over there on you know coming up towards this year. Give us the deep dive here on what you could tell us about the Extraordinaries. The Extraordinaries is my YA debut, which is frightening in and of itself. It comes out May fifth, and it's the queer coming of age story about a fanboy with ADHD named Nick Bell and the superheroes that he loves who protect his city. He, Nick, is the most popular fan fiction writer in the Extraordinaries fandom, but he doesn't think he's that extraordinary himself. However, after a an encounter with one of the heroes he writes about named Shadowstar and who is his biggest crush, it's probably borderline obsessive, he sets out to try to make himself a, an extraordinary, a superhero. And he has to go about it with or without the help of Seth Gray, who happens to be his best friend and potentially, most likely, the love of his life. But this book is – I don't know if you could get further from The House in the Cerulean Sea <laughs> than with The Extraordinaries. It is wild. It is chaotic. It is a – hysterical at least i think it's funny it's but the biggest thing the biggest point for me and the biggest seller for me for this book is the fact that nick is neurodiverse he has adhd i have adhd i am neurodiverse and i 
wanted to see someone like me in a story like that. I, when I was a kid growing up, I never got to see the loud, overly talkative, slightly effeminate kids in books. If we were, if, if we were in books, we were either the, the sidekick who was a caricature or we were attacked and beaten because of our sexuality or we got sick and died. And that was, that was queer characters in books that we, I used to read. And, you know, that's not how it is now for the most part. And that's a good thing. The YA is at the forefront of that, I think with, with queer fiction, but I wanted to see a kid who everybody thought talked too much because that's how it was for me with ADHD growing up. I wasn't taken to doctors to get medicine. I wasn't taken to doctors to get diagnosed until I was older. And I struggled, man. I I had a hard time growing up because my brain was on fire and it never stopped. It never slowed down and it never shut up, which of course made me never stop talking. And, and, and it, it sucked. And I wasn't able to see myself in anybody else. There was always this weird otherness about me that I, that I, I wished I didn't have. But as I got older, I learned to appreciate it a lot more. And because it is part of me and it, it doesn't define me, but it, it, it is in a way my own personal superpower. And that's what I wanted to be able to do with a book like The Extraordinaries is while it is a comedy, while it is funny and sad and happy and, and, and all a whole range of emotions at the center. It's a kid coming to terms with himself, not about his sexuality, because by the time this book opens, Nick and all of his friends are already out and proud. I never wanted to write a coming out story. I think that there's people that do that and do that well. So I didn't have anything I wanted to add to that. And, and, you know, unfortunately, well, maybe not unfortunately, but in YA, a lot of queer stories are coming out stories, which is, I mean, there's a place for that and it's a necessity, but man, I was about to say the line kids these days. That's makes me feel so old. (laughs) (laughs) Younger people is not any better, but they are much savvier than we were when, you know, at that age. And I didn't want to write a coming out story, but I did want to write a story about a guy coming to terms with who he is and, and accepting who he is. So that's what Nick's journey is all about is, is, being okay with not necessarily being the label extraordinary, but being happy with who he is. And it's, it's, it's a good story. I'm very proud of this book and I can't wait for it. And it's actually the beginning of a trilogy and I just finished writing book two a few weeks ago. So I'm super excited about it. And I can't wait to read the first YA from you. Right. Knowing how you structure stories that always bring in all this you know, cool stuff that you bring. I can't wait to see how you do it. And I mean, you've done kids before. You've got kids in Cerulean Sea. You've got the young mm-hmm. girl in Bones Beneath My Skin. Even Green Creek opens when Joe and Ox are both kids. Right. And hell, my first book was called Bear, Otter, and the Kid. Yes. <laughs> and the book, the book is about... You know, a guy tried to raise his 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 younger brother, but this this book is for the most part all about teenagers. They, there's four teenagers, and they make up the main characters of the book. So I had to um, think about that. Writing teenagers, the, the, I actually for for weirdly I had more leeway with what I could get away with in the extraordinaries than I could with House in the Cerulean Sea. I I honestly. Going into YA, I'd never written a YA book before, and I didn't know what you could and could not do in a book like this. So I kind of – I don't want to say I made it chaste because it wasn't necessarily chaste, but I, I kind of held myself back a little when I was first writing it because I didn't you know, I didn't say, oh, fuck this, fuck that, stupid piece of shit, whatever. I was like, oh, this – can can that can be said in YA, right? That's totally fine. And then I sent it to I sent it to my agent. She was like, you, know, "You can you can put more of yourself into this book. It doesn't need to be you know innocent." So I went back and was like, "You know what? I'm okay." And so I wrote it how I wanted it to be. And it's it was interesting to see the perspective of Tor wanting 
the house in cerulean sea to be red for all ages whereas in so we had to take out certain words whereas in the the extraordinaries they were like you know i think i think nick would probably cuss right here right he doesn't he needs to have some kind of reaction so i was like oh okay i'll do that i'll corrupt minors who are reading my book <laughs> it's totally fine <laughs> yeah so it was a, it was an experience and and i i felt much more comfortable when i wrote the sequel because i knew what i could do and what i couldn't do and and there, there's actually, I'm, I've learned, there's some actually pretty graphic YA books out there. There mm-hmm. are some that, that really get into to sex and violence and all of that. Kids, let's face it, teenagers see all that stuff all the time. That's yeah. what, what it is. It, I, it, it's going to make me sound so old, but the reason I didn't see stuff like that growing up was because we didn't have internet <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> until, until I was like 17 years old. So then that was dial up. <laughs> so, <laughs> Copy surf. God, I'm so old. Yeah. <laughs> but to, to be able to write a story for, for the, six, the 15, 16 year old me who didn't have stories like that, that felt good because I, I know there, there's kids out there who don't necessarily get to see themselves yet or still haven't found a book to find themselves where they can say, hey, that person is like me. And I want, want Extraordinaries to be that book. I want it to be that book for them because if I'd had a book like that when I was a kid, Man, I would have helped me so much more. I really, really think it would have. But instead of reading about sad gay characters who die alone or who don't have anything or who just get relegated to the sidekick position, I, wanted, I, w- I want this story to be for the kid who, who wants to see themselves because they are loud or they do talk too much or they are slightly or maybe even overtly effeminate. I want them to be able to have that character here. Mm-hmm. So that's what I wanted to do with Nick. Did you read any YA gearing up to write your first YA? No, not really, because I didn't want to to have anybody else's stuff filter into my head when I was starting out to write. The last YA book I read was, and I've read it a few times now, I think it came out in like 2008, 2009. It's Leaving Myself Behind by Bart Yates. And it is a tremendous, tremendous book about a kid coming out and dealing with mental health issues that he got from his mother, who is also trying to deal with her own mental health issues. And it is a wonderful book, a delightful book. And that is pretty much my extent uh, in YA. I read horror. I read nonfiction i read true crime stuff and that's and suspense mm-hmm. and that's what i read and i don't read necessarily ya i don't read romance i don't read any of that stuff i just i write about it so i i want to kind of keep some distance from it i guess mm-hmm. i should know the answer to this the number of times that we've talked but i mm-hmm. have not put it up in my brain right now did you write flash fiction before or did you just give Nick that characteristic? Just I wanted to give that him that characteristic. I never the OK, let me back that up. When I was seven years old, six or seven, I used to carry around this notebook with me that I would fill with stories about me and Samus Aran, who is a character from the video game Metroid. In Metroid, you play as a big, awesome space marine who blows up aliens and kills everybody and then at the very end of the first game the character takes off their helmet and is revealed to be a woman and that just blew my mind because the entire time you're thinking this is a badass guy who's killing all these things and it's a woman i was like holy shit so seven year old me is like i want to have adventures with her so i wrote stories about me and samus going around killing bad guys bad aliens and so for all intents and purposes I guess you could say I got my start with self-insert fan fiction, which is what I did. But other than that, no, I did not. I haven't written anything like that. And so when I started getting the idea of doing fandom with The Extraordinaries, it was because of people building up fandom for the Green Creek series. And I saw how dedicated and devoted those people, awesome, awesome people were. And I wanted to delve further into what makes fandom. And I will tell you, man, on sites like Archive of Our Own, there are some very, very, very good writers out there mm-hmm. that are that are writing fan fiction. And 
to the point of where I was like, holy shit, why aren't you writing <laughs> original fiction and, and turning around? So this is, this is better than I write. What the hell? <laughs> and it was, it was so good to, to see these people have a site like archive of our own to be able to, to write their stories. I, I wish I could have had something like that when I was a kid. I mean, the, the closest thing I would have gotten was one time I saved up a bunch of money and ordered an X file zine on <laughs> when X Files was on because I wanted to see more of of Mulder and Scully. So I ordered this zine and I think I still have it somewhere that was filled with like fan fiction and fan art of the X Files in the nineties. And and the way it's evolved into what it is now is just amazing. I mean archive of our own, that site is just ridiculous with the the sheer breadth of content that it has. Given how much it sounds like you enjoyed writing extraordinaries and when you get past the end of that trilogy, do you see more YA in your future? Or oh, is yeah. it going to be like oh, yeah. everything else have, that's just I already whatever? have another YA trilogy plan oh, after I finish The Extraordinaries that I, I can't talk about yet. But I, I, I do like it. It's a different, it's a different world. The, the, the coolest thing, I think, so far about The Extraordinaries is that when the book comes out in May – Tortine is sending me out to schools to be able to talk to act to teenagers about Fabulous. the book itself. Yeah. And that is awesome and also terrifying at the same time because they will most likely be savvier and smarter than I could ever be. And so I just don't want to be the old guy coming in saying, I wrote a book, please read it. It's about gay people. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's just, but that's going to be, it's going to be a trip, man, because for all I know, there's going to be one kid in there who, who, was like I was. And, and if I can, if I can give this kid a book and say, here, I hope this means something to you. And even if I never hear from that kid again, but I, the fact that if it does turn out to mean something to them, that's all I want. That's all I could want from something like that. Mm -hmm. When I wrote my very first book before my very first book came out back in 2011, I told myself that if even one person read it, one person walked away from it, happy that they read it, then I would have done my job. And that's still true for me to this day. I don't, I don't necessarily think about, I mean, yeah, sure. It's wonderful when books sell really well and a lot of people like it, but I still go back and think every now and then if just one person likes this story, then I would have done my job, you know, because I don't write for everybody. I tend to write for myself, but if, if somebody else can appreciate that, then good. I'm happy. Mm -hmm. That's all I need. And you certainly made a lot of people happy. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I think that's that's pretty clear they're, by they're some of what we see yelling, in, in, in your Clunatics group. At me in all caps, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. I love them. So we would be remiss if we talked and didn't talk about Green Creek a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, all right. I'm ready. Oh, I'm ready to tease. All right. Let's do this. All right. So Heart Song and Feral Song have been mm -hmm. out already. Uh, Heart Song at the end of end of last year. October. Yeah. Boy, time yeah. flies. So I yeah, know. Heart Song in October last year. Feral Song came out just about a week before we recorded this podcast. Mm -hmm. What a trip. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, what you did with Robbie in Heart Song, uh, you really pulled some fast ones there that were just ultimately really fascinating to, to read and see how that mm -hmm. unfolded. Yeah, and that was planned – from when I started plotting out Raven Song, because I knew when I decided to, I always knew when I finished Wolf Song, I always knew there was going to be three more books. I didn't know necessarily what they were going to entail, but I knew the the order in which the characters were going to have their own book. I, I knew that almost right away. So when I started sitting down to plot out Raven Song back in 2016, end of 2016. I went through and made an outline for all of the three remaining books. So I knew exactly where, where Heart Song was going to go. So in case anybody is wondering, the events of Heart Song were planned always from the moment I started planning the, the Raven Song book. So I've been an asshole for that long. <laughs> <laughs> And I regret nothing. I knew how the I knew how at that point too how the entire series would end, so much so that I wrote the last chapter of Brother Song before I wrote Raven Song. 
I've never done that before, but I wanted to, cause I always want to write in order. Like I like the, cause if there are certain scenes that I want to write, I, I don't want to cheat myself and write it and go to it and write it and then go back and, and lead up to it. Cause for all I know, the narrative could change at some point, mm-hmm. but I, I was so firm with how I wanted this series to end that I wrote the last pages of brother song before I started writing Raven song and I didn't change a goddamn thing when I, by the time I got to it, it stayed exactly the same. So I was like, yes. And it is going to, it is going to not be the ending that people expect. It's going to be a good ending. Hooray. But it is, it is going to be, you won't see it coming. I'll put it that way. Yeah. I, I think, cause I've tried to stop second guessing you. <laughs> <laughs> already, it's probably you know, as I said in my review of Feral Song, I just want them to end up so they can have a good day. Mm-hmm. Because in Feral Song, Kelly has the quip that why can't they just have a good day? Yeah, although he's a lot more explicit than that. <laughs> yeah, and that's really what I want for them because there's no moment so far where they can get maybe more than a week of, and even when they're having a good day, there's still the cloud overhanging that there's still shit yet left to come. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's, it's intentional it, to a point. I don't want it to be too dour all the time, which is why the comedy in those books helps. But it's, it, this is pr- next to the, the tales from Verania series. This is the biggest series I've ever done. In fact, the, in, in the last book, brother saw ooh, a little bit of a tease. It has the longest sustained, battle scene out of any book that i've written mm. there's the 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 big the climax of the book i should say is surprising and heartbreaking and sad and it's going to make s- s- some people angry but it is what it is <laughs> and and but i will say this though I am very conscious of the fact that I have put these characters through a lot and I would not have done so if I did not think that they could handle it as characters and if I could not handle it as a writer. And I will say that I promise that by the end of the book, there will be peace and happiness for people. (laughs) I try to, I try to, I don't want to say for everyone, but let's just say for people, there will be good goodness for people. So I leave them I'm, in a good place. I'm super intrigued by the battles because the battles, as heartrending as they are when they go down, they escalate from what we saw in Wolf Song through you know what was in Raven Song, the battle in Caswell and Heart Song. Well, see, I oh. wasn't even going to say Caswell because I wasn't going to go that far, but now you've said it, so fine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and how everything goes down in the battle that happens there, it's like. It's cinematic. Like, do yeah. you just see all that in your head really yeah. well? Because oh, I yeah. kind of see like a big play I, you, set. You should set see. Up. You should see my 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 notes for this. I block out all of those scenes because I, it's it's like a sex scene. You have to know where everybody's body parts are. You have to know what everybody's doing. If somebody bends a certain way, you have to make sure that they were standing in a way to begin with that wouldn't make that unnatural or make a reader go wait. How are they doing that? It's the same, you know, like I said, it's the same with a sex scene. If somebody does something weird, the reader's going to be like, wait, I don't get how that's humanly possible. So I block out all of those scenes. I have little, <laughs> I have little, let me show you. I have, I have little toys that I use, my little, my little Star Wars Finpo bobbleheads. And I block out these scenes when people are fighting. So I know how the scene is going to look and it, it, takes a long time but i have to get those right because if somebody does something stupid or i forget like in one scene in in heart song towards the end when there's the big climactic battle i forgot one of the characters completely (laughs) (laughs) and like they show up and then i sent it to my beta readers they were like wait where's fill in the blank and i was like oh fuck (laughs) shit so I had to go back and include them in and give them some really cool quippy lines. <laughs> he ran away. He's just not there. Right. He's, he's hiding. He'll be, he's, he's waiting with the cars. It's fine. <laughs> Those things are intense. And then Brother Song, like I said, it has the biggest battle scene I've ever written. And that took me forever to, to write because 
I made it. I, with Brother Song, I knew I was going to have to either go big or go home. So I just – I went big, man. It's a big – huge freaking book where many, many things happens. And it also has to end a four book series and close out four books with their storylines while also allowing Carter and the Timberwolf to have their own story while also having to rectify Carter and Joe and Kelly and their relationship with their father while also needing to wrap up Gordo and his brother and their father and all of the and have to deal with who Ox is or what he is and what he can do. <sighs> How long is this book? It is the shortest out of all the Green Creek books. Dang. So Heart yeah. Song stands as the biggest one that I guess. No, Raven Song is the longest. Wolf Song is a hundred and fifty some odd thousand words. Raven Song is one hundred and sixty three. Heart Song is one hundred and fifty nine, and Brother Song is one hundred and fifty seven. So it's not short; so, it's just the shortest of a long book. Short, yeah, oh, it's it's me you're talking to. Come on, <laughs> let's, let's be realistic here. I love words, but yeah, it is the shortest out of those books. But that is not by comparison to most other books short at all. So people will still get to read. It, originally, when I furnished the first draft, it was like 200,000 words. And I was like, Jesus Christ. So through the magic of beta reading and editing and and working on it better, we got it down to where it should be, which is still longer, twice as long as most queer books. So yeah. whatever. I keep my readers used to it. What's it like to have finished it? Sad. It's sad. I'm sad. It is – I mean – it was originally supposed to come out in December of 2019. Mm -hmm. And I've been finished with it since October of 2018. So I've had a long time to deal with my grief about closing this book, this series. But it's probably going to have to, the wounds are going to reopen when we get closer to August 2020 when it comes out. So it is, I'm glad it's over because I got to tell the story that I wanted to tell. But I'm sad at the same time because I've, these characters, they they mean a lot to me. It's it, even more so than, say, like the Verania series. The Verania series, I love that series because it's my happy place. The Green Creek series is my biggest cast of characters, and I love them all. I love them all for who they are and who they're not. And the fact that I was able to finish their story on my terms is bittersweet. I mean, I'm sure I could have written 10 more books about them, but... What would be the point? It would get boring. I would get bored. Readers and readers would be able to tell that I was bored because the story wouldn't be good. So I want to be able to tell the story, get in and get out and finish. There's authors out there who do fine with telling 12, 13, 20 book series, but that's not me because as you know, I hop around from genre to genre. And if I got stuck too long in one place, I would end up resenting the story I was trying to tell. Mm hmm as the reader of all this, I think it's the most exciting thing that there's going to be people who read Cerulean C or read The Extraordinaries and then go to see what else you've done and be able to get into the Green Creek stories all of a sudden or get into Verania. Please be the right age to do that. But <laughs> Yes. Yeah, that's another thing. Under the advisement of Tor, I updated my website to show like age levels that books should read because I don't want a kid to read like the extraordinaries and some 15 year old go, Oh, let's see what this lightning struck heart is about. And then be like, Oh my God, you are scarred for life. <laughs> There's things in there that no child should read. <laughs> well, and yet people read up all the time. Like I was in God middle school and reading Stephen King. Yeah, me too. Me too. Which is why, which is weird how I'm, I'm like protective over 15 year olds that I don't even know. It's, and you know, I'm not on a good day. I'm like children, blah, whatever. But the fact that I have to, you know, protect them from myself, <laughs> from my books, <laughs> just because I'm like, you know what, give it a couple of years, wait till you're 18 and then read it. That's totally fine. You can wait a couple of years. I have other books. I don't aren't sexually graphic that you can read or have ribald humor that that probably isn't appropriate for your age i mean i'm sure i would have thought it was funny if i was 15 but i don't want to get an angry email from a parent going you corrupted my child right <laughs> because of gay uni unicorn sex <laughs> <laughs> was there talk when you made the the shift of um, going with another pin name or nope never i asked i asked 
if I asked my agent initially if they thought that if if she thought that was a good idea, she said, "Why?" So I said, "Okay, that's fine." So I just kept it as is, and it, it just it makes it easier, I think, because it's, well, it's all in one umbrella. So I, plus, if I if I gotten a, a different pen name, say I went by my real name Travis, and for like the YA, I would have to make like a whole other website, a whole other social media, and all of that. And that's just. Ugh. I can be lazy. Yeah. <laughs> the idea well, of keeping up another e- alter ego is just like, eh. yeah. And I still like it, frankly, as as the person who doesn't deal with it at all. <laughs> that again, the people will find these books that are going to be, you know, such mass marketed, big out there books, and then find these other gems <laughs> that you've got. Like, yeah, and that's, it makes that's me happy exciting for, because if people, if people like my books, matter. they think, oh, what else is he? I've got like. 20 plus other books for you to read. Come on. And even better, they're all pu- republished by me. So all the money goes to me and yeah. that will be even better. So yeah, I'm, I, I have a big back catalog for people to explore that find me through these two new books. Yeah. Which is awesome. Yeah. Let's talk about your amazing readers. The Cludatix has grown so much over the last couple of years, at least that I've been paying attention to it. It's such yeah, it's ex- only a couple of years old. Well, there it you just, go. I, it was started in 2017. Oh, I thought it was longer than that. So yeah, nope. I, so yeah, just just a couple of years old. It's an amazing community. It is full of just incredible people with some of the best stories. You mm-hmm. alluded to some of the fan artwork, which is truly incredible. Yeah, that the, I mean the artists, man, that 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 put out the fan work are just nuts. And the, what I love about it is is all their different styles. Everybody has a different way of interpreting a character. Everybody has a different way of drawing a character. And what I even love about it even more is that people who are nervous that maybe have never drawn something before and they publicly say on their post, I'm nervous about posting this, but I wanted to, to for people to see it. Everybody's so awesome. Everybody's so nice. Everybody's so kind. Everybody's so generous and I just like that. I like it when people are nice to each other. I like being, I mean, we, you know as well that this past year has kind of sucked Mm -hmm. for us in the writing community and a lot with who we publish with and with an organization who was supposed to help protect us. But when you, when you take that all away and, and step back from all the crap that's happening around us and you look and and you see people who are posting their artwork or people in in a, Facebook group who are having bad days and posting about it and everybody else is commenting how how much they want to make them feel better and and you're going to be okay everything is going to work out that's what it's all about you know it's about it's about being nice to each other it's about being kind to each other and and going through it together because whether we like it or not we're in this together i mean it's 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 better to help each other than it is to ignore each other and I wish that more people would realize that. And I'm very fortunate with the Clunatic community that that they understand that and they see that that's what I like. And that's what that's what they they a lot of these people are just the generous, giving, kind people in the world. And I couldn't ask for a better readership. What do you think it is in your books that resonated to gather these people together? I don't know. I mean, <sighs> It's good. I don't know. I, I think that I think that that there's there's always there's always a sense of of otherness in my books to certain characters. Like we talked about before, they're they're not, you know, traditionally handsome people with with an eight pack and a huge dick and and gruff voices and all of that. And I I I think that that people see what I like to write. Even in the most fantastical of, of scenarios that I, I write, I like to write real people. I like to write how I think people talk and how I think people should actually act. And I think that that what I well, I hope that what my readers see is is the realness from it. Even though you know it's fiction, you and even if say you're in a kingdom of Verania and you're trotting around with a unicorn and a dragon named Kevin, that you can still think that you know. These characters are realistic. They're lifelike, even when they're doing stupid stuff, especially when they're doing stupid stuff, because I want people to say, hey, you know what? I've made that mistake before, too. 
this is what I learned. Oh, and this character is learning from it too. And that's important. It's important to me that when people read my books, and, and I think that that's what's happened with like with the Clunatic community is that they they can see themselves in these books. You know, we're not perfect. We make mistakes. We have we struggle with with mental health issues, with anxiety. We're too loud. We talk too much. We we're too effeminate. We're too queer, too gay, whatever. And and they they can see part of themselves in that and. I I like to think that I've gathered the biggest group of misfits in the world and I love each and every one of them because we belong to each other. Well said. You guys got <laughs> together last October. Yeah. Like 60 people, man, at, at, at my friend and beta reader Lynn's house. That was nerve wracking for me because, you know, there's people who are like, yeah, by the way, we're coming from Australia just to see you. I was like – what <laughs> do you do you do you really want to do that <laughs> but hey, was, i hope lynn had true. a big enough house to support 60 people they did. i would not yeah, want 60 in lynn's my house, house. Lynn's, lynn's, yeah not my house either well i probably could but i do, wouldn't want to <laughs> <laughs> but lynn was lynn was a gracious host and everybody there was so freaking cool and it was awesome and i got a sign a bunch of books and play games and eat and drink and laugh and talk. And, and Michael Leslie came and Kurt Graves came and did some performances. They're my narrators for my audiobooks, and they did some performances and it was just, it was awesome. And it was, it was, it was a lovely, lovely experience with lovely, lovely people. And we're hopefully going to be doing it again. We're trying to make it a yearly thing. So that's awesome. It is. It is. It was a. It was a wonderful time. And I was thrilled to hear that Kurt is putting together the Clunatics podcast now to more yeah. document, yeah, the stories behind these readers. Yeah, that's going to be super, super cool. I'm so excited about about him. This is all him too. This is him, and I think Mia is who's the one of the admins of my Clunatic group, and also my beta, one of my other beta readers. I think she's helping him out with it. And that yeah, the Kurt approached me with the idea of wanting to do a podcast about about the Clunatic community and and my journey through this next year. And I said okay go run with it. And he has, man. So whenever that comes out, all the credit goes to him because he is, he works his butt off. He does, he does everything to make it the best it possibly can be. And I'm very, very fortunate to have somebody like him on my team. The podcast, if I remember right from his teaser at the end of Feral Song, I believe comes out March 20th. So it'll be right after this Oh yeah, podcast comes out. <laughs> yeah, so download that. It's it's. I think it's going to be the Clunatics. I think that's the name of the 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 podcast. So you should be able to find that wherever your feed is. I don't know how many episodes he's planning or anything like that, but it's going to be a trip, man. It's going to be pretty crazy. Yeah, looking forward to that. And I did another shout out to him for the work he did on Feral Song with adding the music score and everything that just and you did all of that for free man he's mm -hmm. he's such a freaking good guy he is such a very good guy and i i i, I adore him and michael leslie too michael's joining me on my journey with tor he's going to be doing the narration for the extraordinary so oh, fantastic yeah yeah i asked tor if he could do it because it fits him perfectly and they said is he good and then they listened to his samples and then they talked to him this is all done within 24 hours i said i sent them an email and by the next day at that exact same time he was hired to do it and i said holy crap i have clout <laughs> but no he 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 got it based upon his his work and i am very very excited to have him along with me to have a familiar face <laughs> while i go play with the big leagues that's awesome. So we've talked a little bit about some of the stuff we know that's coming. Extraordinaries is a, is a trilogy. What can you tease about what comes once we get past August and Brother Song? Yes. So 2021 is going to be The Extraordinaries 2 and a book called The Tremendous Death of Wallace Price, which is a comedy about death and dying. I think the best way to describe it is it's a reversed Scrooged in that 
the main character isn't visited by three ghosts before he dies. He dies and goes to see three alive people. <laughs> and he has to, he's not a good guy and he's actually a bit of a dick and he has to learn to accept himself and become a better person all while dealing with the feelings he has for a man who whose tea shop he is technically trapped in because he's a ghost and that's a big big story it's a rumination on death and one's place in life while also being an absurdist comedy and then in 2022 <laughs> that's going to be extraordinary's three and a book i've already written called in the lives of puppets which okay it is a post-apocalyptic comedy retelling of Pinocchio. <laughs> wow. I don't even how to know how to put my head around that. <laughs> it is wild. It is about an inventor named Victor who finds an android and in a in a scrap pile and he basically gives the android a heart and the romance is between himself and the android and Victor's sidekicks are a are robots that he's built up and given personalities, one of which is a Roomba vacuum named Rambo, who has it who has anxiety. And then oh the God. other is a nurse the other is a nursing machine named Nurse Ratchet from uh, uh, a clockwork orange, except Nurse Ratchet is nurse registered atomicon to care heal educate and drill that's what nurse ratchet stands for (laughs) and she's a sociopath so (laughs) so this book this book it's as of right now i mean plans could change but that's going to be the capper for this unofficial trilogy starting with cerulean because they both even though they're not related in plot they're not set in the same worlds in any way shape or form they all run a through line of kindness and moral philosophy and so those three books all deal with those in in those themes in in various ways but yeah i've already finished the book i was supposed to write for 2022 good for you (laughs) because wow i know right (laughs) yeah that's what's going to happen but there's going to be a bunch of other surprises in there because i plan on releasing three books a year two with tour one one tour, one tour routine, and then one that I most likely self-publish on my own. So, awesome. I, that, I'm gonna. My next book, I'm hopefully gonna start writing, is gonna be a return to the Verania series and writing the fifth book in that series. So, oh, people are really excited about on. that. Yep. Where's the place people go to keep up with you to to follow everything that happens in this awesome journey? Yeah, you, the best the best place. I'm most active on Twitter, TJ Clune. There, I'm on Instagram, TJ Clune, Facebook, the Clunatic Group. Just search Clunatic, K L U N A T I C, and my website, TJ Clune Books. Dot com and I have to update that more. <laughs> Tor wants me to update that more, but best place, honestly, follow me on Twitter because that's where I usually am these days. Fantastic. Well, TJ, we wish you so much success with everything that's coming out. And it's it's wonderful to see this happen. I'm so excited. Thank you. It's going to be a wild and crazy adventure, and I cannot wait to show people what's next. This week's interview transcript has been brought to you by our community on Patreon. If you'd like to read the author interview for yourself, simply head on over to the show notes page for this episode at BigGayFictionPodcast.com. And thanks again to TJ for spending so much time with us to tell us all about these great books. Now, he mentioned the tour for The House in the Cerulean Sea. As you can imagine, that tour has been postponed. But if you're listening to this on Monday or Tuesday as we drop this, there is a virtual launch party happening on Instagram, courtesy of the Barnes & Noble in Fredericksburg, which is where the launch was originally supposed to happen. We'll have a link in the show notes page to their Instagram, and you can also watch TJ's social media, especially Twitter, for other events happening online around the launch of this book. Also launching this week, we mentioned the Clunatics podcast in this interview, Monday, March 16th, the same day this episode comes out. The first of that podcast debuts with the How to Be a Clunatic episode. I have had a preview of that. Kurt Graves has done 
such an amazing job putting this podcast together. It's very much kind of docu-style, This American Life kind of thing. I can't wait to hear what else Kurt does with that. And one last note, if you want a little more TJ, beyond the interview we did here, we recorded a Q&A session for the Big Gay Author podcast, where he talks a little bit about uh, why he writes, his process, and some other things. So you can find that in episode 32 of the Big Gay Author podcast. All right, I think that'll do it for this week's show. Coming up next week in episode 233, Lisa from The Novel Approach and Jay from Joyfully Jay will be here. And they're going to recommend some of the books that they have enjoyed in the first quarter of 2020. Yes, they have so many good books that they've read. So be ready for your TBR to grow a book or two or maybe six. (laughs) That'll be coming up next week. Remember, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter when you have a book. Until next time, everyone, please keep turning those pages and keep reading. Big Gay Fiction Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more shows you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. New episodes of this show are available every Monday wherever you get your podcasts. You can help support this show with a monthly pledge through Patreon. For more information about joining our community and the bonus content we deliver, check out patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. I'm Kurt Graves. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. 